Oh, good. Yeah. But David was so thrilled when he said, So he called me the next day. What I want to do is welcome you all to this wonderful event. This is something I've been looking forward to for a long time. How many of you have seen the video that plays over and over and over inside our building about the renovation of our <laughs> building? And the star of the show we have with us today. And it's not just the star of the show, but really the star is the building itself. And we would not be here today if so many people had not put in so much time and contributed significant money and really put their heart and soul into preserving this building and making it our new home 20 years ago. And we're so fortunate to have the general contractor for that work here today. And he's not just a general contractor in any sense. He's one of the few, I would guess, a handful of people who does what he does. He is truly a log craftsman and expert, and we're fortunate to have him back today. And of course, I'm talking about David Rogers. Um, <laughs> What we're going to do today, this is a two-part thing. This is a free demonstration that, that David is going to be providing us all. And he will talk for a little bit at the beginning, and then he will get hands-on with his tools and materials here to show you the craft of his trade and really tell you a little bit of his story about how he got to be in the position that he is. And so please don't feel like you are rooted in your seats. You can get up and watch him as he does his work, and you can follow him around. Um, and then what we're really hoping as well is that you will be so inspired by what you see today that you'll want to come to the West Five in the Junction tonight. Um, at 6.30, we will have... Uh, a, it's called a no-host dinner. In other words, you can come to West Five and pay the $10 donation cover, but you don't have to order a thing, or you could order dinner, or order a drink, or whatever, and you get to hear David talk and do a PowerPoint presentation about not only our building, but um, other projects he's worked on. You are in for a real treat today to be able to experience David Rogers. Would you please all give him a round of applause? Thank you for your kind remarks, Clay, and I'm glad to be here, glad to see all of you here on this beautiful day, not rainy or nothing. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me without this? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no. 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 Yes. No. For, the, for the intro part, let's keep the mic, and then when you're ready to get the right. on, we'll put it away. Well, as you know, this building has been here for a century or more, and Clay asked me to come and be a part of a reminder of, of why we all do what we do. And I came up with a, a plan to show what this building looked like only in half scale. So these logs that are 10 inches, 12 inches in diameter, these are five, six inches in diameter. But the methodology and how to think about doing what it takes to join logs together uh, is what I'm attempting to provide here in a visual format. You mentioned, Clay, about what I do, and I'm reminded of maybe a, why I do what I do and how I got to do what I do. 
might be interesting, and that is that long ago, when I was in my 20s and 30s, I was uh, started out in the woods as a logger and really liked the physical part of that. I was in good shape and could walk up the hill. And if I wanted to go to the top of that mountain, I just went up there and I didn't hardly slow down. And it was it was a good feeling of being out in the in the forest, the untouched forest of Northern California was quite a remarkable experience. And probably that has disappeared for the most part because of industry and changes in civilization and so forth. But I did get to experience that. And when I moved to Oregon, I again was in the woods But things were changing in me to the degree where I was starting to question what I was doing and why I was doing it. And the industry at that time was doing things that didn't make any sense to me. And I, I had a really hard time. And I'd go to work and I'd be mad because I be out there. I liked being out there. It was good work, paid well. But it bothered me. So after a while, I had a family I needed to work, but I couldn't do that anymore. So I just quit and thought, well, now what am I going to do? Where I lived up on Mount Hood at the time, I thought, everybody up here needs a woodshed. I can build woodsheds and sell them for enough to feed the family. And at the time, the Forest Service was giving out permits for this size wood, a little bigger, something that I could cut down, pack out, put on the truck, mm -hmm. hold the house, peel. And then what? You know, how, do you, how do you fit logs together? How do, how do you do that? So for a long time, a year or more, I go fiddle around and think about it and go home at night and oh that doesn't look right, oh, that could be better. And there weren't any examples of that kind of work other than for big buildings. Which I wasn't I wasn't laying horizontal logs, I was trying to put them upright and join them together so that they'd be strong. And fortunately in a couple years of, by guess and by golly, I ended up with an opportunity to go to a, a school up in British Columbia, log building school. And it was as if a light bulb went, I, I, I get that now. I understand how you, how you can, be creative with putting things together in a tapered, irregular cylinder. So, from there, I have been, let's see, I was in 83, so 30, 30 years ago, um, I began this journey of log related and was fortunate to have met people along the way who encouraged me and assisted and uh, provided opportunity, worked with the Forest Service as an instructor in traditional tool methods, National Park Service and other entities, and then became a contractor and bid on projects from state, federal, private. And over the years, learned about this topic called 
historic preservation. There's an actual discipline that is got books and vocabulary and definitions and all kinds of opinions and guidelines and food for thought on how to approach dilemmas that are in need of attention and, and how do you how do you start where do you where do you go so this building was one of those projects on the bigger scale for my life of city government, architects, engineers, city of Seattle, tight quarters, lots of traffic, lots of parts that needed to be solved in a good way. And so this, this uh, demonstration is to remind myself on how we did what we did. Because every one of these buildings is different. Every one of them. The notches are different. The, it's all unique. Each one of these things is unique. And, and so when we approach a, a job that needs doing, the first thing that I find is most important is to understand who did the work, how they did the work, what tools did they use to do the work, and why. Why did they do the work? So all of that is fascinating to me. It always gives me pleasure to learn and to revisit our past and and that is important to me in helping these surviving examples to survive a little longer. So anyway, my uh, job I think is to just go through how to start and how to get to the next one and how to get to the top eventually. So one last thing before we get off the mic. Um, I want to see a show of hands. How many of you here were here when David was doing his work 18 years ago? Raise your hand. Marilee Hagen, our former board president. John Bennett on our board. Who else? Carol. John Kelly over here. Long, long time member. Knows more than anybody about so many things. And Carol Vincent, former board president. Former many things and current, <laughs> current uh, garden committee chair. These folks who were here from then, they are part of the bedrock of making this happen. Could you all give them a round of applause? <laughs> now, David, as I understand it, you're going to be getting hands-on here, and uh, you're going to need to use your, your loud voice, but, but also... Um, you're going to be moving around this apparatus and you're going to be encouraging people to get up out of their seats and see more closely what you're doing, right? Sure. So let's get started with that part of the program and thank you very much. I'll put the mic back and you're free from the cord. <laughs> if I can talk loud enough. Yes. <clears throat> if my voice lasts. Generally speaking, a building starts out with an idea of shape. And most of the time, the shape is a true geometric square or rectangle. However, that's not necessarily true all the time. But in this case, it is. I've laid out center lines. I've measured equal distances and um, begin the process with the layout. So the first half of the first round is called the sill logs. 
the second half of the first round are called the spandrel logs. And they're usually laid in the same direction, the butt, the tip, butt, the tip, and then butt, tip, butt, tip. And by that I mean that a tree grows, and as it grows, it gets smaller at the top. So the butt is the bottom, and the top is the tip. So they're tapered. This diameter is probably fatter here. I don't know, four and three quarters, five and an eight. So that's the tip. Tips run this way in this case. Now that's not necessarily always the case, but in this case, that's what I'm doing. And in order to keep things sound and secure, I've already cheated and When those who came here in the early days, Danny, Doc Maynard, for this part, over in Ellensburg, Kittitas Valley, down in Oregon, the settlers, the, the initial wave of immigrants to the valleys on this side, they, they cut down what was in the way and then they they just stacked it up and they didn't necessarily care whether there was a foundation because the logs themselves raised it up off the ground and then they put in their floor system so that they weren't in the mud and it lasted them for 10 years 20 years and till they did something better so no and yes, because the, the right way and those who were thoughtful and came from a informed background would have, by choice, found a big rock or maybe a stump or something, something that would get it off of the ground enough to where air would circulate and uh, and have it level. And, and in that <laughs> process, they would make it level more or less. Because they didn't have levels. And, and they, so, so anyway, they weren't all that technically interested in doing things like we take for granted these days. It was a temporary shelter for the most part. For the homestead and the and this carriage house, that's a good question whether or not they put it on some kind of a foundation. Probably they did, but it was probably a poured concrete spot that was a little thicker, and then they they'd start from there. I'm guessing. Portland cement didn't come into being until 18 or yeah 1870 or something like that. Pretty recent, really. So, uh, please ask questions. I'm I'm all about that. I like talking about what you're interested in. Now, I've already gone and put 
the spandrel log. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I feel like we should have all the toddlers on here. <laughs> there you go. Now, uh, back in the day, oakum was around for shipbuilding and other plumbing and lid stuff. They'd pack the cast iron pipes with the bell and the, the bell and the, the other part that they pack around the joint and then they'd heat a lead pot pour the joint for the stacked cast iron plumbing. In boats they'd use it to fill in between the wooden planks and make it watertight. In log building, they put it in these joints so that the air wouldn't flow through so easily. What's the oakum made of? In, is it a it, natural fiber? It obviously. is. It was the hemp. Hemp? Okay. In the, in the so. old way. In, uh, nowadays, I mean, it looks like wool or jute or rape or something. Something. Rape seed or this something. is a. They make it dry like this, or they make it an oil. So, what I've uh, done for for sake of simplicity because these things take time to develop is to I've laid out already the the width of this opening on the ends of the logs and I've already established how far I'm going to go down with my with my bottom notch and Back in the day, when they didn't have nice chalk boxes like this one, <laughs> they would use string or thread and they'd use a bit of charcoal from their fire ring and they'd run their string through their charcoal block and they'd get it sooty. And then they'd be very selective on what was important enough to snap a line because it was kind of messy and took time. So they did what they needed to do, and it's surprising how few lines you really need. When snapping a line, it's important. So, I, for example, I could be over here, I could be over here, and and I get it a line that was not necessarily where I want it. So I'm careful to line up the plane of the snap so I'm, I'm producing a line that is where I want it to be. So that's the bottom.
plane took me over to the other, to the homestead earlier. And I was surprised to see that the notch in that building is different than the notch in this building. And it made me wonder, I had always thought that whoever built the house built the carriage house. But then I wondered why they did it different. How much time had elapsed between the building and the two, you know? In that photograph, they're together. Mm -hmm. No, 06. So, so yeah, I don't know. So what this basically uh, has allowed me to see is where I'm going to stop in the removal of the wood. Now I know that the bottom where I need to start. Center is, this is four feet, the center is two feet, and then from the center to the center I think is 14 inches. So I'm going to come here 14 inches. center and then it's going to be two and a half inches so that's an inch and a quarter do you try to make the cuts as close to the your your notch as close to the size of the one that you're matching it up to, you know what I mean, so that they fit really snug, or are you trying to have a little leeway because of the expansion and contraction? In green wood, yeah. uh, it's going to shrink. Right. It's going to get, instead of two and a half inches, it's going to be two and an eighth inches. The shoulders, instead of two and a half inches, are going to get wider. So they're going to go away from each other uh -huh. in green wood. In dry wood, probably not. They're not going to change that much. But the more important thing is that if it were going to be unimportant to be airtight, mm -hmm. then trying to go as tight as you can and make it too tight to fit <laughs> or just right to fit is probably a good thing. But it's better to leave it a little sloppy mm -hmm. so that you can, uh, if you want to carve out a little groove in the side when you put it together and then pack oakum mm -hmm. in there as a gasket right. for air uh, infiltration. Yeah. On the inside, now on, the, on this quadrant, that would be true. On the outside quadrant, it's better to have it open because then the, the rain and the debris and stuff can fall out mm -hmm. instead of get stuck in there. Yeah, don't be over there. And the homesteaders didn't know all that, did they? <laughs> well, they probably did. <laughs> they probably, they probably, they probably knew it. a lot more than we know now. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to go. Thank <laughs> you.
Are you making those marks based on the location of this log, just eyeballing? Center lines. Okay. And then offset. And for this, and probably for if this were full size and to become a home, it's close enough. For the style of a of a uh, structure. Uh, I hope I'm not jumping ahead. Yeah. You may include this when you were talking about you know the button, the tip of the logs, and the taper. Do you alternate that? Then say your next tier of logs. Would you then reverse so exactly that you had the right. butt and tip and like that to keep it as level yes, as possible? Yes, because the first round is going to be higher on one end. Right. And then the the next one is going to even that out. So every even round, it should be parallel. That's yeah. that's the target. Yeah. <laughs> Depending on your logs. Right. Lumber being a vital uh, organism. Is this logical pine? Or this is Douglas fir. Douglas fir. Oh. Okay. Where do you get your logs? In the woods. <laughs> Sorry, I just. Har, har. <laughs> um, Somebody's got to set it up. Right. He'll pay you later. I'm getting a log dog. I don't have a dog. Yeah. This sounds good. That's good. In this day and age, it's it's harder to find wood because the Forest Service is pretty well hamstrung with what they can provide and give permits for, and then the private land warehouser and other major landowners they're not all that keen on having people. Out in there. But they do give permits and and that is a, an option. This this wood came under those circumstances. I got a permit from a long view fiber at the time. And uh, this was these are leftovers from a project over in Redmond. So this kind of wood, however, is really rare anymore. The, this piece, this tree is probably 70 years old, maybe. And nowadays, when the big timber companies harvest, they replant with a a genetically engineered seedling that grows fast and it gets big and it it grows uh, you know maybe if this were out of that stand maybe it would be six years old or ten oh, wow. years old it would be really fast and it is for paper or uh, other uses when they sell it for lumber in Home Depot or wherever it is, and you look at, at the growth rate of that wood, it's quite fast growing. So the strength of the tree is really in the winter ring, the hard ring, the one you count. Uh, or looking at that sort of thing. 
that's real dense, real hard, real, real stiff. And the wood between those two hard rings is the, is the, uh, they call it the summer wood, and it's spongy and soft and uh, it, it decays quite rapidly. So this wood it looks like it was pretty fine, fine grain. The wood that that the people who built the place used was either on the property or it came out of the sound. Uh, the, on some of these logs on the porch, there's holes for the cable that went through, you know, a boom log, they called them. Aww. And it'd come on shore and they'd... I know where that one goes. <laughs> Bought a new saw. It's hard to do. It <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to cut to the line on both of those sides. And I'm going to do that. This would be done with a chainsaw. <laughs> What's your process for taking the bark off? Or have you ever that? This wood was removed. Okay. Um, that wood and the homestead wood and a lot of the early work wood. The bark was removed during the spring when the sap was running. So with a spud or a shovel or a hoe or a stick, you can get in between the bark and the skin of the tree and it just it falls off and it leaves a uncut surface. When the bark is stuck in the summer, winter, spring, then, then you need a, a draw knife. And that's done with you know, in this action. So you try and find that seam between the bark and the skin and do what you can. And it's important to get the bark off. 
because that's where the bugs like to hide. Huh? What do you do about the bugs? Well, you avoid them <laughs> in the first place. But if you have them, then usually they're there because of a reason. And usually that's moisture from a leak or too close to the ground or something. So more overhang, higher off the ground. But if they're already in there and you can't do anything about those, then you got to kill them with some kind of something. <laughs> <coughs> and there's <laughs> there's friendlier poisons than yes. others. There's uh, we use borate compounds, which is a kind of a very alkaline. It's like it's like salting them to death. It just it's not as it's not bad for humans so much, you know, unless you eat it or something. <laughs> but it's not going to be as toxic as pentachlorophenol or some other, you know, chemical word. Okay. It's a natural compound. Okay. And what it does is as the invertebrates ingest it because they're eating their way through and this the borates are within that which they are eating it messes up their digestive system and they don't survive but a cat or a dog outside yeah yeah it's like so much salt West Coast on the west side of the Cascades, Douglas fir, cedar, um, not pine, not spruce. Although yeah, that's a very general answer, the more correct answer would be the design has more to do with longevity than the species. So if you design a, a building that does not see the sun, big overhangs, then you could build it out of cottonwood if you wanted to. Because the sun isn't going to degrade it, and the rain isn't going to get to it, and it'll be dry. So <laughs> it's... Uh, would you mix woods in a building? Sure, yeah. Um, Similar compression requirement, or can you mix the soft and hard? Or? <laughs> sure. Again, it depends on why you're mixing the wood. You know, if it's because that's what you got on your property, and it's hemlock, and it's fir, and it's cedar, maybe some spruce, and they're growing in a similar form so that they have a generally similar symmetry where their taper is about the same, then why not? But if you have a cedar that goes like this and a fir that goes like this, they're not compatible from a joining together point of view. So they're, I think if you had to, 
and it was the last trees in the world, you could probably do it. But hopefully that's not the case. <laughs> And the density is a good point because it depend again it depends on how they're joined together. Because if you're going to flatten the top and the bottom, then it probably doesn't matter. But yeah, because there's so much bearing area on, on everything. But if you're gonna scribe it like this and it's just those just those edges that are touching, then the weight bearing that's biting into the wood below, it may not matter even then because it's over such a long linear space that by the time you divide up all that weight, it's, it's not that much. So it's, it's biting in where it will and if it's resisted because of a knot or something, it won't. And so it, it sort of finds its own resting place. And so I, I don't know that density would really matter enough to worry about it. Good thing to think about, though. If this was big wood, I wouldn't be doing this. <laughs> <laughs> Do you work with the crew usually? Or? Yeah, usually there's two or three of us. And on repair work, that's a, you can't go real fast. <laughs> but when you're building from the ground up, mm -hmm. then you could have a, you know, a bigger crew because there's more to work on and you're out of the way of each other mm -hmm. and you don't have to go back. You can just lay it and go up. Go up. <laughs>
chainsaw, it would be. Do you care if you're working with dragwood? Do you care which way that radio check pack is working? Trying to make it point down? When, yes. Uh, yes. If there, if this log has a major crack in it, and we'd want that either down so it's completely um, protected, or to the side, either way, but not past halfway. So if it's spiraled, you'd, which this one sort of does, uh, you'd want the uppermost por part below halfway. In dry wood, it, it's evident where the check is. But in green wood, Generally speaking, that major check will happen on the side that's closest to the heart. So very rarely is there a tree that actually has the center in the center of a circle. Because they're, you know, they're ish. <laughs> you ever put one in in Greenwood? I've, I've seen Japanese temple columns where they cut one in on purpose. On purpose, exactly right. And then they, I think that <laughs> dirt, and that's an entirely um, spiritual event where they, they do a ceremony at the tree, they harvest it in a certain way, they handle it in a certain way with respect. They bring it to where it's going to be kept until it's used. And they peel it in a certain way to where the skin is, is intact. And the, um, the kerf is chosen by somebody who sees it and then it's stored upright. It's stored vertically for a period of time until it's ready for its use, from what I hear. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of wood were you talking about? In Japan, I think they use fur. And they use, uh, well, it's, a, it's different species of what we call fur or our indigenous Latin names are a little different elsewhere in the world but they're similar in characteristics. What you got in your hand? Uh, chisel? Other hand. Mallet? <laughs> <laughs> And so to your point of the grain orientation, when I'm removing the wood, I'm starting where it's going up. If I started the other way, it would go in, which happens on occasion.
good. Um, when I'm trying to get something flat, an aluminum face, a, a level or a square, if you rub it, it'll leave a oxidation. So you can see where it's rubbing. And you want it to only be touching on the outside. Not right, exactly. Oh, you mean with gloves? Yeah. Mm, usually not. Sometimes I regret it. <laughs> and it depends on the wood yeah. circumstances. Always wise to be smart instead of <laughs> proud or Somebody wants to. Yeah. <laughs> he said that there's one left. And they wanted to do it. John. <laughs> Yes. When did they first invent a level with the mercury or the a bubble concept? Mm -hmm. Well, glass has been around a long time. I'm, I'm sure that, you know, the early Americans they had glass vial, cast iron leveling devices. Water, water, water levels have yeah, been around I mean, forever. Just, yeah, just yeah. like the market, put water on it. You know, but you'd have to have a tube that was able to carry the water. Well, what I was thinking, you just have a container and make a mark at a certain level. You could, I mean, use it. It wouldn't necessarily be at a at a location, right? At yeah. a spot, you bet. Yeah. yeah. They figured out all, you know, some way. Yeah. 
up then. Better than yeah. <laughs> Five degrees. Do you have a favorite brand of tape measure, David? Wide. <laughs> Wide, yeah. Wide and stiff. Yeah. <laughs> so usually that's the Fat Max or something yeah. similar. For I'm pretty hard on them. They seem to hold up better. Do you ever wear safety glasses? I do, Excellent. on occasion. <laughs> That's good. And ear protection. Yeah. All the time, All the time. around yeah. saws and such. Yeah. Steel toe tubes. And they're more important than gloves. Gloves can be dangerous. <laughs> So I was just measuring the angle. So why did you chop that out instead of sawing that? Faster. Okay. Funner. That's <laughs> <laughs> cool, right? Yeah. <laughs> but you could saw it out.
Greenwood is much nicer. <laughs> Watch my fingers. <laughs> Somebody else want to do this one?
So there's no difference between doing it with the axe and doing it with the saw? I mean, the end results are the same? No. <laughs> well, yes and no. <laughs> yes, in the sense that the shape is the same. Uh -huh. No, in the sense that a saw, when it cuts, it frays the fiber. When you cut it with an axe, it shears the fiber. So the texture of the wood is a cleaner, more resistant to absorption kind of a face. With the saw, it's more hairy. Uh -huh. it, it absorbs better. Uh -huh. So if you're wanting to apply some kind of a penetrating something, then a sawn surface is more receptive to penetration. With a shorn face, it's hard. It's, it's, there isn't much there to, to stick to. It's, it's really flat. Which, from a longevity point of view, that's better. That's right, he's thinking. Because you wouldn't get moisture damage. Yes. As much. <laughs> but if you have good overhanging. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you find that you can get a fine tuning with an axe better because if the saw following its own plane, if it starts to bow or do something weird, then you've got that. Of course, you can always. When, when you're axe. cross cutting, a saw, a chainsaw, is no different than a handsaw. It's faster. But when you're cutting diagonally or horizontally, then the saw is faster and you can brush a very flat, straight face with a chainsaw. But it's not the same as if you were to get within a smidgen of what you want to end up with and finish it with a slick. Yeah. You know, uh, it's, it's cut instead of hairy. Yeah. Yeah, I could tell it was interfering. Now, if we had a CNC machine or something. <laughs>
So then the uh, next part is dropping it to where it needs to go. And that's a relative question because if we were going to scribe fit it like that work or the homestead, then we'd need to include a allowance for additional dropping. In this case, we're not going to do that for now. So I'm deciding already that I'm going to take it to a line that I've already established. So I'm going to snap a line through here and then saw this portion of the notch out so that it drops a certain distance. And I forgot what that was or else I'd tell you, but it's what it is. It should be the same as that one. Let me get done. Exactly right. It's the, the general idea is to start with dropping it to about half of the diameter of the one above it. And then from there, there's adjustments made to allow for either an irregular lock or a gap that, you know, there's the bottom log does this and the top log does that, so you have an exaggerated hole for different reasons. But the starting point is to have a target that leaves the shoulder about half the diameter tall. If you're always working one course up, you would know your next course if you're laying this course. As in new construction, that's true. You're always thinking about a round and a half ahead. You're, you're, uh, you have a general idea of the logs you're working with. You have a general idea of what each even round needs to be at when you get there. And so as you're building to that target, you're decisions are based on, or the math decisions are based on on the target and and the uh, reversal of tapers, the shoulder heights. In scribe fit buildings, you also then add an allowance, usually it's about an inch, for the loss to the scribe. So your target is an inch taller, mm -hmm. and when you scribe it, it's okay. sort of close. Okay. But in restoration work, it's more critical to, your targets are not what the new logs are, it's where the existing logs are that you're trying to match. And yeah, so it's a different way to get there, but it's a similar, process. Are these logs typical diameter for what you would be using or is this like a, a, a small scale example type? Yeah, yeah this is a half scale representation of this building. Yeah. 
So when you string that chalk line around, why don't you just lay it down and pull it tight and then snap it? If the log were round with no bumps or dips, then that could work. But if it has a hump in it and you and you lay it down tight on that end, the string is you don't know where it is really. It's hung up somewhere. Not necessarily in the plane that you're trying to mark. But if it were a pipe, you bet. Yeah, it wouldn't matter. So now how come you you one snap it once before you you lose your lot of your chalk? You, is that on purpose? It is because there's too much on there. It makes a fat pine. Oh, okay. Log work is all about reference lines. There's very little other than that. I bet you have a red chalk box too. You know, I'm colorblind. And if it's red chalk, <laughs> oh, it might as well be invisible. The contractors have too. So yeah. if they chalk a blue line and it's wrong, then you just go back and get a red chalk box and chalk it. <laughs> yeah, if they sent me on a job with red chalk. <laughs> I'd come back and wonder what I was supposed to do. My instructors taught me that in log building there's such a thing as T L A R. T L A R. And what that stands for is that looks about right. <laughs> <laughs> but you're not building a cello. <laughs> not most of the time.
Well, in the day, they probably had lots to choose from. In our day, we try not to screw up. But, you know, it happens, and you just have to go get another one if it's that bad. I mean, if, if it's that bad. And, and it does happen. But when it does happen, the next time, you're really careful that it doesn't happen again. <laughs> With this style of uh, log construction, do you do any do you chink between logs? Oh, okay. Right, cool. Okay. Horizontally? Yeah. Um, this building did, as I recall. On the inside? You can't see On it. The, didn't we put oakum in there? Oh, you, I don't really remember, don't actually. Remember. You said you put oakum. I know we put oakum in the notches, in the corners. But now the dimension that I... I well, it looks like things fit really nice and tight all the way down. But a lot of log construction isn't that precise. They end up putting um, chunky cement. Yeah. We call it the mortar yeah. chinking in between. Yeah. And then apparently the more modern type of log homes use a synthetic chinking. Uh, chink in. And I'm, I am really curious to know if you have an opinion on, especially on retrofitting back to an older log home using that synthetic material. I, I've heard there are some real problems with that. You know, it, again, I, it depends on so many things. The condition of the wood, the applicator, the preparation. Um, and there are differences between company products. Uh, some are stiffer, some are thinner, some are... Uh, Easier to work. The complaint that the chief complaint that I've heard of is that it tends to not allow the log to breathe, and that becomes a problem with um, yeah, with bugs and and just rot. Yeah. Uh, it's the synthetic ones. <laughs> not easy. It's not. If if this were, you know, laid up there, and and it was not scribe fit, then the compound, whatever it is that you choose, cannot, should not be thick. It should, you shouldn't just take your gun and squirt this and make it, you know, an inch and a half out here. Uh -huh. The manufacturers say, and that's probably true. Instead, they want a uniform 
thickness of their product backed with a backer rod of some kind. So you have a vertical face that is a gasket that's covered by the compound. So maybe and the other part of it is with moisture entrapment. If you have green wood, of course, no, no matter what you do, it's, if you seal it, it's in there. Mm -hmm. So you can treat it with a borate or some kind of agent that would inhibit organic life until it dries out and then you're probably okay. But if you don't, then yeah. It also depends on the quality of the wood. Because if you're using pine or spruce, something porous, that's not a good combination. But if you're using something that's dense and fine grain, it's probably not that much of an issue. Because it doesn't absorb. And there's nothing in it, maybe, as much, not as much. Because the sap would, this, you know, there's only that much sap wood in this tree. But in most trees, it's thick, you know, it's an inch and it's wide grain and it's full of sugar and mm -hmm. stuff that bugs and others like. So it's a tricky, tricky question. Your hand is not a hammer. <laughs> I've been told again and again. Uh, yes, yes, and and the hemp would be on the inside quadrant. So I'd make a groove here. All the way down, and I'd make a groove here corresponding to it in this one. And then when it's down, I'd stuff that with oakum. And you pound it in or just stuff it in with your fingers? I'd lay it in the bottom of the notch. So the air is stopped coming in this way and it's stopped coming through the shoulder. On the outside, this one, this one, and this one, it's okay. In fact, it's preferred that there's air movement. Yeah. And how would you do the groove?
shoulder that's two and seven, two and a half. Two and a half. Two and a seven. This one looks tall. So it's two and seven eight. I don't think it's down all the way. Shouldn't be pounded. <laughs> so that should <laughs> Where is that tool? Hey. <laughs> Yeah. 